So picking up our story, uh, we have the Constitutional Convention going on. It begins in May 25th, 1787, and it's going to take until September 17th to wrap up. And the reason why it takes so long, a, a number of things had to be worked out. We just saw that we had to work out how we're going to represent ourselves in the legislature. And now we're going to look at the Southern Objection. The Southern position on uh, slavery was that if you do anything to in any way stop slavery from carrying on as it is, we are not going to sign the Constitution. And in particular, they were looking for certain things. There's three different things that they object to, and we're going to take a look at how these were dealt with. First off, slaves are people, and they should be counted for representation, but slaves are also property that are paid for at great expense, and they should not be counted, therefore, as taxation. So they're trying to have it both ways. You, I think you need to decide one way or the other. If they're people, then they're not property, and if they're property, they're not people, and uh, you can't count it both ways, but this was the argument the Southern delegates were making. Northern states had mainly outlawed slaves for the most part by 1787, and they said slaves should be counted as property for taxation and not for representation. Eventually, a compromise was reached where three-fifths of slaves would be counted for both taxation and representation. So as you see these three men here chained together, this is a more modern picture than 1787 because there were no cameras in but uh, you see these three men chained together for the purposes of representation and taxation in the South. Every five men will be counted as three men uh, if they were non-Caucasian slaves. Furthermore, they asked for and received the Fugitive Slave Clause. This is actually quoting where it is found in the Constitution. Constitution Article 4, Section 2 stated that slaves, and remember they don't use slavery in the Constitution, but they say other persons, that slaves who escape must be returned to their owners. The compromise on slavery was designed to satisfy the demands of the Southern states. It's accepted by a majority of the framers to get the support of South Carolina, North Carolina, and Georgia. North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia will not sign the Constitution without this clause. And finally, the slave trade compromise, the third thing that the slave holding southern states, those three in particular, wanted. Well, the northern states wanted to see an end to slavery. They think buying and selling of people is wrong and it should stop. Southern states said, if you do that, we're going to ruin our economy. So what was decided was that slaves, actually enslaved persons from Africa, could be brought into the United States for the next 20 years. So the year 1808 is the end of slavery. This is 1787. It's 20 years up the line. Slave trade with the United States, however, can continue. With these three items in mind, transatlantic slave trade compromise, the Fugitive Slave Act, and the Three-Fifths Compromise, those three states are now on board. And it's very important. Uh, we, we can object to the framers doing this for many, many reasons. But it's very important at this time that they do this in order to get all 13 states on board to sign the Constitution. You cannot have any holdouts. Next, we have the way we are going to divide up the different powers held within the Constitution. So this one's titled the federal system, the division of powers. And you see Congress can't do anything than what it says specifically in the Constitution they can do. The actual powers that go with Congress, the president is the executive branch, the Supreme Court and judicial branch, are called the enumerated powers. Enumerated means numbered. If a power is not enumerated, then it's called a reserve power. These can only be used by the states and not the federal government. So the things that are left over, well, actually, we're just going to look at a chart here. It's going to tell you the things that we can do in the federal government and things that can be done by the states. And right here, if you, again, taking notes as you are supposed to be taking notes, you should make a Venn diagram 
enumerated powers uh, and reserved powers with the area in between being the concurrent powers. The enumerated powers are to declare war and negotiate treaties, to issue money. They decided, the framers decided it's very important that we have one currency for the United States instead of 13 currencies for each state. They also have the ability to regulate inter interstate and foreign trade. Interstate meaning if you're doing business between the states of New York and New Jersey, even Pennsylvania, as you change, as you cross state lines, the federal government must be in charge of that type of business because it does not fall under the jurisdiction of either New York nor New Jersey. Therefore, it's interstate. Also, foreign trade. And finally, to maintain the military. So what the states get is, number one, to regulate education. And you may not be aware, but every state has their own education system. And every state gets to emphasize certain things that are important to them. So if you move to Tennessee from Florida, what you're taught in Tennessee is going to, in some ways, be different than what you're taught in Florida. Now, math is still math, but it could be the type of math that you're going to be taught in one state versus the other. Concurrent powers, both federal and state, levying taxes, they get to both levy taxes. Crime and punishment, you have federal crimes, you have state crimes, and they are different sets of punishments for those crimes, whether it's called, whether you go on trial for a federal or for a state crime, different sets of punishment will apply. Uh, and I also skipped off the reserve powers to go back up. Granting licenses, so your driver's license will say state of Tennessee, your hunting license, state of Tennessee. And if you go down to Georgia, let's say, and you're hunting, you don't even realize you've crossed the state line, and you were to, say, kill a deer and go to try to get that deer processed, took care of, and they find out that you were in Georgia when you killed it, well, you're going to be in trouble because you don't have a Georgia license. you got a Tennessee license. Also, fire and police protection. I had a couple people earlier in class give me a quizzical look about the police. Yeah, there's a state police. Every state has a state police force. Highway Patrol. Also, fire protection. We have uh, state fire marshals who in inspect buildings, and you also have a state forestry division that takes care of our forest and hopefully keep them from catching fire. And finally today, checks and balances. The framers separated the powers within the federal government to prevent too much power belonging to too few people. The legislative branch makes laws. The executive branch signs or vetoes those laws, making them go into effect. And then the judicial system, for example, will decide whether or not that law is constitutional. And if it is not constitutional, the judicial system can strike it down. The legislative system approves presidential appointments. So uh, who is that? The executive will appoint federal judges, including the uh, Supreme Court justices. And also there are nine of these justices appointed by the president. They can overturn the rulings of other courts. That's the highest court in the land. And if you're appointed there, it is for life. So there you go. That's the end of the Constitution. They're ready for some sort of quiz. I'm sure.